You're listening to a podcast from leadculture.com. This is Tony Collins, and this is my talk on Before the Wolf Pack, the story of rugby league in Canada. I want to start with a phrase that I think is very important when we discuss the history of rugby league in Canada, and perhaps the history of rugby league as a whole, but we'll start with Canada. And it's this, rugby league has never missed an opportunity to miss an opportunity. And I think for most people involved in the game, for most fans and supporters, they'll understand what I mean by this, that rugby league has had a number of of significant opportunities to expand in Britain and around the world. It, it, it's never really taken to a whole variety of reasons. Some of them are about objective circumstances that it could do nothing about, but others are about a lack of vision and a lack of will to make the most of the opportunities that are presented to sports. And I think the history of rugby league in Canada demonstrates both aspects of this miss, ability to miss opportunities. Because one of the most interesting things I think about Canada is the fact that when you look at the origins of Canadian football, which for those of you who don't know is a, to date it's very similar to the American gridiron game, to American football, apart from the fact it's played 12 a side, it has three downs instead of four downs, it's played on a bigger pitch, and it has a number of other differences in the rules that make it a far more open and passing based game than, than American football. However, Despite the fact that most people think that Canadian football is merely a variation of American football, many of the innovations that were brought into American football as it developed from rugby were actually the invention and the initiative of the Canadians. In 1874, McGill University, which was really the home and the birthplace of of rugby football in Canada, McGill is one of the uh, is the was the elite university, the elite English speaking university in Canada, and like other universities and elite un- educational establishments around the British Empire in the middle of the nineteenth century, it took up rugby because it, rugby was seen as the embodiment of the British virtues of muscular Christianity. McGill became the centre of discussions and developments for rugby. In 1874, they were invited to play Harvard at at what was then called football. It wasn't soccer. It was a kind of hybrid, a hodgepodge of different rules that each university had come up with to try and make the game of rugby, or more generally, uh, football as as it was generically called at the time, to make it more attractive and more appealing. Uh, They played two games. The first game was played 11 a side. And the second game was played 13 aside under McGill rules, which are really, uh, at that point, very much rugby, uh, the rules of the Rugby Football Union. The Rugby Football Union had been formed in uh, 1871 and it, it had standardised rugby rules at the time. However, within a few years of the Rugby Union being formed and its rules being standardised and taken up by other clubs... In Canada in particular, there was a lot of dissatisfaction about the way the game was played. And in 1875, what was called the Football Convention was held in Toronto, where the the leading university clubs met to discuss how they could improve the the rules of rugby. Most of the delegates wanted to keep the rules as they were. Partly this was out of deference to to Britain, because uh, Britain was not only the home of of rugby, it was also the the centre of the British Empire. So Uh, empire loyalty was very important however for McGill and University College Toronto and some other teams rugby had a big problem and it was this the Toronto Daily Globe described the scrum as quote an exhibition of brute force by 30 men crushing and jamming in a surging mass the McGill delegate to the convention said the scrum was a monotonous uninteresting and dangerous feature of rugby that he wanted to get out uh, wanted to get out of the rules of the game and in fact what happened was that despite the fact that the convention actually voted to endorse rugby union rules McGill and Toronto and a handful of other clubs started playing their own version of rugby which is essentially rugby without a scrum 
what this meant was that they had to think about how the ball was brought back into play after a tackle. And so what they decided on was that after a player had been tackled or couldn't make any further forward progress, he would put the ball down in front of him and heel it backwards with his foot to a player who would then pass it out and the game would begin again. Now, obviously to a uh, to anyone who's seen a game of rugby league, they'll be very familiar with this because it's essentially the play the ball. And the Canadians had really were really pioneering an early form of play the ball and what was then adopted by American football and in American football became the snap at the line of scrimmage, which again you see today, although the foot is no longer used and it's no longer used in the Canadian game. But Canada was responding to the same issues about the rules of rugby that the northern clubs in that formed the rugby league were responding to in the 1890s and early 1900s. And you can see this by the subsequent development of Canadian football. They changed the scoring system to make tries more important than goals. Tries were awarded four points. Two points were awarded for a conversion. In 1894, the value of a penalty goal was reduced from four points to two points. In 1902, they reduced the size of the team to 14 a side and then eventually to 12 a side. They abolished the line out. All goals became two points. And this sounds very much like the same route that Rugby League began down after the 1895 split. Tries became more important than than goals. So uh, in Rugby League, the try became three points. All goals were reduced to two points. Penalties were reduced to two points instead of the three points that they'd been under Rugby League. And then in 1906, sorry, under Rugby Union. And then in 1906, the Northern Union decided that Rugby League would be played by teams of 13 aside instead of 15 aside. And that after a tackle instead of a scrum, the play of the ball would be introduced, whereby the player would stand up and play the ball behind him with his foot. Very similar to Canada. Now, this seems like an op- a prime opportunity to link up between the Northern Union and the, Canadian fo- and the Canadian football authorities, which were paradoxically called the Canadian Rugby Union. And it wasn't until the 1950s when the name the Canadian Rugby Union was finally dropped by the uh, Canadian football's governing body. But until that point, it was still called the Canadian Rugby Union. And in many ways, it seems like the, uh, the Canadians were doing almost exactly the same thing as the rugby league authorities were doing. And certainly, I mean, I've spoken to historians of Canadian football who can't believe that there was no link between the two between the two games of the 1890s and 1900s, considering they were doing the same thing. It's also the case that a Hunslet player from the 1890s emigrated to Canada and, according to his family, played for the Toronto Argonauts, then as now one of the leading teams in Canadian football. Uh, but I've not found any evidence that that he played for Toronto, although uh, he could have played under an assumed name or played for another team. So there's the opportunity for links. But the real problem that faced Canadian football and rugby league football coming together was the fact that Canadian football was an amateur game. Strict amateur regulations had been introduced in 1896, almost exactly the same point that the Northern Union had introduced uh, broken time payments. And because Canadian football was dominated by elite university teams and it saw itself as a representative of the uh, the moral principles of sport in the British Empire, it was inconceivable that it could have linked up with a semi-professional game like Northern Union. Because remember, regardless of the rules that were being played, amateurism had tremendous social cachet professionals were looked down upon and the idea that an amateur sport or an amateur club would play against a professional club within a type of rugby whether it's american football canadian football rugby union uh, was absolutely unthinkable so the the great potential that there was to link the two games up by the way they were played on the pitch was lost because of the fact that amateurism would not allow any type of rapprochement between rugby league and Canadian football. So the opportunity was lost, although through no fault of the of the rugby league authorities. However, where I think we must point the finger at the rugby league authorities is the fact that there was an opportunity to at least uh, fly the flag for the rugby league game in Canada through the medium of the regular tours that took place between Australia and New Zealand and Great Britain. 
Effectively, from 1910, a four-year cycle of tours to Australia by a British team, followed by tours to and from Britain by Australian and, to a lesser extent, New Zealand teams, had been established. It was easy for them to pass through Canada on the way to or from the Northern and Southern Hemispheres. That only took place once in 1928 when the 1928 Lions Tours, the tourists played two games in Vancouver and Montreal, exhibition games between England and Welsh representative teams, although they were, um, because there were so many Welsh players in the Great Britain team at that point, they could play, they could organise two 13 side games of England versus Wales. They weren't followed up on it. It was the only time that happened. And it was a big mistake. And the reason why you can tell it was a big mistake was simply because that's what Rugby Union did. The 1906 all Blacks, arguably the greatest rugby union team of all time, played in Vancouver on their way back from their tour of Britain. The 1908 Wallabies played in America and Canada on their way back from Britain. And in 1912 and 1913, the Wallabies and the uh, All Blacks played separate tours in uh, Canada and America and helped to consolidate rugby union in the one area where it was stronger than Canadian football in Vancouver on the far west coast. And obviously the links between Rugby Union, Australia and New Zealand and the west coast of America. So Rugby Union had also uh, established a foothold in California at that time. The opportunities there were taken by the Rugby Union authorities. And in fact, throughout the 1920s and 1930s and then again in the 1950s, the touring teams of Rugby Union always played exhibition matches in Canada on the way back from their tours of Europe. And that helped to consolidate Canadian rugby union. But also it meant it was so it was seen as part of an international network. And that was an incredibly important aspect of the game in Canada. And it also meant that Canadian rugby union, when it played against these teams, was seen as a representative of the Canadian nation. And that brought you know, lots of press coverage and lots of interest that mere club football of whatever type could not bring. So Rugby League really missed an opportunity to make the most of its touring teams and spread the word and help to establish the game in Canada. And it's not as if there were no other opportunities to help in the 1930s. For example, in 1933, the Lucy University in Halifax, Nova Scotia, on the the far east coast, actually switched from Rugby Union to Rugby League. It played two seasons under Rugby League rules. Uh, It didn't play against other universities uh, because they were still playing Rugby Union. But within the university, various departments, schools and colleges played their games under Rugby League rules. And this was thanks to a a very interesting character of whom we need to know more. More research should be done. A guy called John McCarthy, who was an Irishman, but allegedly had played Rugby League in Britain at some point in the early 1920s. He had moved to Canada and had become a rugby union coach, and he was a very successful rugby union coach, uh, both at the university level, but also, more importantly, at the club level. The The Maritimes area of Canada, on its eastern coast, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, was a the only part of Canada where rugby union could be seen as a game for all the classes. It was played by the elite universities, but it was also played by miners and industrial workers. And in 1932, John McCarthy became the coach of the Caledonian Athletic Club, which was a team from a a mining town uh, that was composed almost exclusively of miners. They dominated rugby union in the Maritimes provinces of of Canada throughout the 1930s. They won the the championship uh, that was called the McCurdy Cup for something like nine years from 1932. They also were eventually allowed to play the elite university teams for a cup called the McTeer Cup, which was played throughout eastern Canada. And they also dominated that. So they had proved themselves to be not only the, uh, the best team out of the local regional clubs, but also from the university clubs as well. McCarthy himself was seen as a rugby intellectual. He wrote regularly for the newspapers and people sought his opinion on the way that rugby rugby should be played. And it's clear from reading the reports that he coached his teams to play in a very open, fast handling way, which was clearly, really between the lines, was based on the rugby league style of play. However, when the war broke out in 1939, 
the maritime provinces, the, the whole complexion of sport in the maritime provinces started to change. This was predominantly because clearly the North Atlantic became one of the major theatres of World War II. And so the maritime provinces became a, a major centre for the Canadian Armed Forces, for the Canadian Army and for the Canadian Navy. The dislocation caused by the outbreak of war meant that, that rugby union, many rugby union clubs t- stopped playing the game, lost play- those that survived, lost players to, to the armed services, but also that the Canadian military brought its own game, which was predominantly Canadian football, to the area. And so you could sit, so people in the Maritimes could go and see top class Canadian football. And because of the, um, when America entered the war in 1941, the influx of American troops meant that American football was also played there. So rugby union suffered because of the competition, not just simply because of the, the problems caused by trying to play sport in the war, but also because of the organised competition from the armed services of the Canadian and the American militaries. However, John McCarthy came up with a plan to rescue rugby in the face of this, this onslaught from uh, the Canadian and American games. And in October 1943, the Halifax Rugby Union, the governing body of the game in the region, voted to switch to play rugby league rules. And uh, John McCarthy wrote a letter to John Wilson, who was the secretary of the rugby league at that time, who was a keen expansionist and played a central role in bringing the game to France in the early 1930s. Uh, McCarthy wrote to Wilson and said, we've decided to start playing rugby league. I'm familiar with the rules of the game, but can you please send me half a dozen copies of the official guide with the latest rules so that we can start to play on an organised basis. And I'm really very pleased with this decision and I hope this will be the start of a long uh, and fruitful relationship between rugby in Canada and rugby league in, in England. Obviously, there were significant problems communicated between Canada and Britain at the time. Obviously, the, the Merchant Navy had more pressing concerns when they were going between Britain and Canada across the North Atlantic than uh, making sure they had the up-to-date copies of the rugby league rules. But nevertheless, rugby in the maritime provinces as a whole switched to rugby league rules. And when sport started for the very first season after the end of World War I in 1946, rugby league rules were the, was the was set of rules played by, by rugby players. However, it meant the, 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 the sporting scene had changed significantly since the 1930s. Uh, rugby was no longer unchallenged as the major uh, football code in the Maritimes. And this was summed up by a, a cartoon that appeared at the beginning of the 1946 period, uh, season in the Halifax Herald, uh, one of the leading dailies in Nova Scotia, where the two players saying, it's the start of the football season, fantastic, it's back. However... Are we playing Canadian or American or English football? And if it's English, we will be playing 15 or the 13 aside game. And the caption read, this year's football promises to be even more confusing than last. Uh, in fact, it was even more confusing than the, um, than the cartoon itself suggested because there was also a growing interest in, in ice hockey. And of course, as anybody who's ever watched ice hockey will realise, its attributes are very similar to rugby. It's very physical, it's very fast, it's very open. And it, again, going back to the 19th century, the original rules of ice hockey were actually based on the rules of rugby. You know, it's not stretching the point too much to say that, you know, there's almost five codes of rugby being played if we include ice hockey. Nevertheless, the, the adult game, the adult game of rugby league was reasonably successful for the latter years of the 19, 1940s. However, its lack of resources, the fact that it was played in very small towns and the fact that other teams, the uh, particularly Canadian American football and ice hockey, had far greater resources meant that the game struggled. It was limited geographically and so unlike when you're watching Canadian football or ice hockey, when your team played, you were play- your team was playing in a very small region. Canadian football, you could see them. You could see teams from right across Canada playing, similar to ice hockey. There was an attempt to start rugby league on the western coast of Canada in 1950. A, a guy called Sid Gaunt, who was a Canadian who'd gone to England and allegedly played rugby for Rochdale Hornets, came back to Canada after the war as a coach, was a very successful rugby union coach, and then decided that his team, which was Jarvis Bay um, Athletic Association, which is one of the leading athletic clubs in on the uh, on the west coast of, uh, of Canada, should switch to rugby league rules. Interestingly enough, 
the um, the British Columbia Rugby Union contacted the Rugby Football Union at Twickenham about this, and I've seen the correspondence in the Twickenham files. And the Rugby Football Union sends a telegram, because it's very urgent, to the British Columbian Rugby Union, expressing their concern about rugby league being played in British Columbia, and said they will send a letter. A few months later, British Columbia, the British Columbian Rugby Union writes back to Twickenham saying uh, they have con- no connection with uh, rugby league being played in Vancouver. Clearly, steps are taken by the rugby union authorities in Canada to stop the spread of the rugby league game. And in 1952, after a couple of seasons, the Jarvis Bay Athletic Association switched back to rugby union rules and it effectively become the, one of the dominant teams in rugby union Vancouver throughout the 1950s. They're still coached by Sid Gaunt. And again, they play a very open handling form of rugby that is based really on a rugby league style of play. By 1952, by the end of the, the experiment on the West Coast, Rugby league in the East Coast, in the Maritime provinces, is in a very bad way. Financially, it's struggling. It's it's not very well organised. The impetus has gone out of the game, and the Canadian game and ice hockey are dominant are the dominant sports in the Mar- in the Maritimes. Partly, this is a result of the media because radio and slightly later te- television allow people to become part of a of a national sport, which Canadian football and ice hockey were, whereas rugby league can't offer anything on a national scale either in terms of representing your region against uh, other regions of Canada or on an international level which is something that rugby union can offer but this is also something that rugby league could offer if it had wanted to there was a conversation in 1948 about an anglo-french tour of Canada which would have been interesting because obviously uh, Quebec uh, in Canada is a french-speaking province but nothing came of that in 1953 uh, Bill Fallerfield, who's the General Secretary of the Rugby Football League by this point, explicitly does not want to invite the Canadians to participate in the inaugural World Cup that will take place in 1954. And he criticises Antoine Blanc, who's the President of the French Rugby Union and the organiser of the 54 World Cup, for, invite, for attempting to invite the Americans. And this is really, I think, a crucial missed opportunity. If the Canadians and the Americans had played in the World Cup, you know, no doubt they, they probably wouldn't have won any matches, but this would have signalled to the media in Canada and America, these, this was an important sport and a sport in which national te- their national teams could actually could actually compete. It didn't happen, and by the time that Bill Fallowfield visits Canada in 1955, the game's almost dead, and he really doesn't know how to revive it. He suggests that Lord Beaverbrook, who's the Canadian owner of the Daily Express, should be asked to support the game, but there's no reason why he should, and it amounts to nothing. And by the... Um, the late 1950s, the adult rugby league game in the Maritime Provinces is dead. And it has to be put down to the ability of rugby league to miss its opportunity. Once again, rugby union teams, Australia, New Zealand and the British Lions, always stop off on, uh, in Canada on the way to and from tours to the Northern and the Southern Hemispheres. In fact, Canada actually, the Canadian rugby union team actually beats Australia in 1957 and then in the 1960s they beat the British Lions and so you can imagine what a boost that is for Canadian Rugby Union and it's easily the case that that could have happened in Rugby League as well but because no one in the game had the wherewithal or the will or the foresight to organise these matches Rugby Union had the field clear to them. The game did continue until the 1960s in the schools and interestingly enough the schools champion, the rugby league schools champion in 1958 and 1959 was a, a school called King's Collegiate School. Now, for most people in rugby league, they're used to the game being predominantly a working class game and it's played and it's not played in elite private schools. Um, and that's been an issue that's confronted not just the game in Britain, but particularly the game in Australia. However, in Canada, King's Collegiate School was effectively the the Eton or Harrow of Canada. It was the oldest private school in the English-speaking world outside of Britain. It had been founded in 1788 and rugby was its game. And they played rugby like the other schools in uh, in the Maritime provinces in eastern Canada at the time under rugby league rules and they were the dominant champions in 1958-1959. The game still flickered and in a, a, a fantastic rearguard attempt to, to actually make the most of the opportunity 
St. John's School from New, New Brunswick in Canada actually went, came on a tour to England in the 1961-62 winter season. It was a very bad winter, so they missed an opportunity to play, uh, to play many games. They played one match at Stanley, and a photograph of the team was in the clubhouse at Stanley, certainly up until the 1980s. And they also put, uh, played a curtain raiser to the Castleford versus Featherstone Boxing Day Derby match. However, it was too little too late, and the game effectively died in Canada. There were a couple of attempts to revive the game in, in the 1980s. A tri-state league was set up by British expats in Canada. And at the 1999 Student World Cup, a Canadian team were the plate runners-up. But nothing much happened until the 21st century, when the Canadian Rugby League was, was founded and started to do a tremendous job in promoting the game and establishing a national team. And then more recently, when Toronto Wolf Pack was founded. And I think that the foundation of the Canadian Rugby League and the establishment of the Wolf Pack brings us back to where we started. Rugby League's ability to never miss an opportunity, to miss an opportunity. What's going on in Canada today gives the game the opportunity to not miss that opportunity, in a sense to correct the mistakes of the past hundred years of Rugby League in Canada. And I think this is, it's a, it's the most propitious possible time to do that um, for a number of reasons. If we look at the way the game missed its opportunities to expand in Britain and around the world in the past, much of that was to, was to do with distance and the difficulty of travelling great distances. So in, in Britain in the early 1900s, the game in, was established in Devon and Cornwall just before the First World War. It died out because it was far, far too difficult to arrange games between the North and the far Southwest. Similarly, when the game was established in South Wales before the First World War, the distance was just too far to maintain again. We can see the same thing in the 1950s with the case of Yugoslavia, when the game, um, partly due to hostility of, of rugby union, but also because the difficulty of, of travelling that died out, and in a small, more episodic way in Madagascar as well in the early 1950s. However, today, those problems don't really exist in the same way. And also and this is true of sport in general, we now stand on the... I was going to say we stand on the verge, but we actually stand in the middle of the fourth sporting revolution that is going to change sport around the world for good. When sport started, sport started as we know it, modern uh, spectator, commercial spectator sport started in the middle of the 19th century. It was driven by two things, transport, and the media revolution. The transport revolution at that time was railways, which meant that people could travel to and from games. Clubs could compete. You could have league systems, cup competitions, because it was possible to play other teams in other towns. Fans could travel. And developments in newspaper technology, mass literacy, meant that daily newspapers covered sport in a way that was inconceivable previously. In the 1920s, a second revolution took place when... Developments in steamship travel meant that tours could take place regularly, which the rugby league took advantage of. The radio brought sport into people's homes for the first time ever. So now you could listen to your team when it was playing, uh, whether it was in another town or whether it was a national competition in another country or another, another continent. In the 1950s and 1960s, television brought pictures of sport into people's homes. The invention of jet passenger air travel meant that it was easy for teams to travel great distances to play matches so the European Cup began in soccer because it could be televised and teams could travel around Europe on easily on aircraft and in the States the same thing happened to American football and baseball which for the first time expanded to the west coast of California and the west coast of America because it was easy for clubs to travel there on planes and you could see your team's live on TV. Today we're in the midst of another revolution, a digital satellite TV revolution that means if you have the money, you can have a satellite subscription and watch pretty much any sport in any country of the world at any time. And the internet means that you can be as much a fan of your team, even if you live on a different continent, as you can if you live in the same city as that team. And that's the next horizon for sport. We can see today the NFL is talking about establishing a 
franchise in London. Rugby Union is talking about establishing a North American uh, competition that will compete against European teams. And it's only a matter of time before we see a team from the North American continent that's based in the North American continent playing in a European-based competition or a team based in Europe playing in a North American-based competition. Toronto Wolfpack mean that Rugby League is at the very head of that revolution. And it needs to be successful. Everything is in its favour. There has never been a more propitious time to make the most of that opportunity and correct the mistakes that were made in the past 100 years of Canada. I don't really want to be standing here in 10 years' time saying, and you can see the NFL and Rugby Union have now got their teams that compete across the Atlantic. And Rugby League was the first team to do that, but it never worked out for a whole series of reasons, just like I've explained here today about the different uh, opportunities we had in Canada. Uh, I'd rather be here in 10 or 20 years saying Rugby League was the first to do that, and now just look at where the game is. So, Canada is a great example of both how Rugby League has missed opportunities, but it's the best example today of how Rugby League can make the most of an opportunity and put itself at the head of the global sporting revolution. Thank you.